we not only have this boldness, we have confidence as well. So we not only can come to God frankly, I think is what it says, and exactly who we are, but as we do, we come with confidence that there's no condemnation and no judgment from God. One of my, one of my favorite descriptions of uh, coming to God and asking for wisdom is in James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Without, repro- without reproach means without him making fun of you. Without him sitting there thinking, oh, you're coming again for wisdom? You're coming again in prayer? Like, haven't you figured it out by now? Instead, God's joy is in you coming to him. God's joy, and, and, and the more messy you are <laughs> when you come to him, the more it exalts and honors Christ. Now, what, is, what I'm not saying is that we, we should glory in our sin. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that when sinners come to God, it shows the wisdom of God because only Christ can make that possible. And we don't have to pretend like we're someone we're not. That's exactly where Paul goes. It's in Christ in whom we have access, and it's through our faith in Him, and it's in Christ Jesus. All of this access that we have to God as the new creation kingdom temple is only possible because of Jesus. And this is exactly, this is just in a, uh, maybe a more poetic way, maybe a more detailed way, the same thing that Paul said at the end of chapter 2. We are the new creation kingdom temple, and the ceremonial laws have been done away with, so we don't need a priest We don't need circumcision. We don't need special washings. We don't need ceremonies. We need none of that. We just need Jesus. And if we have Jesus, we can get into the throne room of God and talk to him. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you haven't done. If you're in Christ, you have direct access to God as part of the new creation kingdom temple. We end with Paul's pastoral concern. When Paul is in prison, when Paul is in prison, what's his concern? His concern is that the Ephesian believers would lose heart. That's what he thinks. When he's in prison, he thinks, how is this going to affect those people? Will they be discouraged by it? Which reveals, once again, the pastoral heart of Paul. Right? The pastoral heart of Paul thinks about how this is going to affect the different people that he knows. He doesn't think, what will they think of me? He doesn't think, how am I going to get out of this? I'm not saying those thoughts weren't there. Maybe those thoughts were there. Pro- probably the thought of, what are we going to do moving forward was there. I mean, Paul was pretty strategic in claiming his Roman citizenship, appealing to Caesar, things like that. He clearly thought through, what's my plan? If they say this, what am I going to say? Things like that. I'm not saying he w- wasn't concerned about himself, but he was very concerned about how those he had preached the gospel to and ministered to and labored alongside would feel. And he's not worried that they're going to feel like disowning Paul. He's worried they're going to feel discouraged. That's why he writes this whole section. He wants them to not be discouraged. And he calls this imprisonment an imprisonment for them. I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. He's suffering for you. He's not saying that he suffers like Christ suffered for us, or has an atoning effect. But his suffering is for the benefit of the Ephesians. The Ephesians are benefiting from his imprisonment. Or we'd say he's, we could say that he's imprisoned because he preached the gospel to them. Not to like condemn them, but to remind them that, uh, this is what's happening right now in my imprisonment is nothing to be discouraged about. It's actually a sign that the gospel is going forward and the new creation kingdom is winning, is winning and the forces of darkness are trying to stop it, but it's not going to happen. So don't be discouraged. Paul is saying, remember that kingdom through suffering has always been a part of God's plan. It's through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. It's through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And kingdom through suffering has always been a part of God's plan. So don't be discouraged. 
Me being in prison is not a sign the gospel is not going forward. It's not a sign the gospel is bound. It's a sign that the, the gates, of, or the forces of hell are trying to prevent us, but they're not going to win. Suffering in the kingdom of Christ, in the new creation kingdom, is not a sign that the gospel has stopped, or a sign of your disobedience, or a sign of your lack of faith, or a sign that Satan is winning. It's a, actually a sign that the gospel is going forward in power. And Satan hates that. And he wants to stop it, but he can't. He can only look on like Christ on the cross and marvel at the wisdom of God that he would use suffering to move his kingdom forward. A kingdom through suffering shows God's wisdom. Showed it at the cross, showed it in Paul, and shows it in us as well. When the kingdom can go forward in the darkest of times, in the darkest of places, in the most unlikely of circumstances. When the more they're persecuted, the more they grew, grow, and multiply. That is when God's wisdom is most put on display. So preach a theology of suffering to your people. Like your people here need to know this. People here need to know that beatings and imprisonments and all kinds of death, sicknesses, are not a sign that the kingdom is failing. It's a sign it's going forward. It's a sign that we are winning. Yeah, I think, um, I think Ephesians would say there are evil spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Because that's what Paul says in Ephesians 6, right? Um, Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And this is why if we think of heaven as simply that place we go to after we die that has the gold, then we're missing a, we're missing a huge element of biblical cosmology. Yeah, I think, I, and that's why uh, Psalm 82, I think, is the psalm that we quoted earlier, that God judges the evil spiritual beings for not bringing justice. But he call, it call, it's called the council. The divine council is what it's called. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's p- potentially describing evil spiritual forces, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, in short, earth is, where, is our dwelling place and heaven is God's dwelling place. He- heaven is the place where the spiritual beings reside, in Ephesians anyway, and earth is where we reside. And the goal of the Bible is that God's dwelling place and our dwelling place be the same place. Um, what is the third heaven? Either, I, I, this is what I don't, I don't think Paul is dividing, like, categories of heaven. Like, some, pe- some people like to think that. I haven't ever been convinced by an argument. I think he's probably using hyperbole there. Like, I'm caught up into the highest heaven. I'm caught up into heaven itself, kind of thing. Um, I don't think he's trying to say that, like, some people get to the first heaven, some people get to the second heaven, some people get to the third heaven. And, like, the goal is getting to the third heaven if you have a more righteous life or something like that. I, I've never been convinced about things like that. Um, yeah, I think in short, it's the spiritual realm where the spiritual authorities reside. Um, yeah. yeah. And texts like Ephesians 6 li- lead me in that direction. Yeah, um, maybe, but not necessarily. I, yeah, I would say no, it's not. I mean, Paul, John is using apocalyptic language to describe that. I mean, he uses, he, he sees like a big sea of glass in between himself and the throne, and yet he's able to fully see what's happening at the throne, right? Um, I don't, I, he, and he's, he's caught up in his spirit into that throne room. I don't think it's a literal description of what heaven looks like. I think it's an um, apocalyptic description 
of the throne room of God. Because Isaiah's throne room looks different than that, right? Ezekiel, when he sees the wheel inside the wheel, which represents the temple tabernacle, um, Ark of the Covenant, um, that looks completely different. Yeah, you know, I, I think that these are just God using the imaginations of the different authors to write what these locations look like. But what does heaven actually look like? I'm not sure. I'm really not sure what it looks like. But I do know the hope of this world is heaven coming down to earth is where it ends. And so I think our eternal state, you know, some, some of us will be living in Toto, I think, for eternity. Some of us will be living in Nairobi for eternity. Some of us will be living in Washington, D.C. for eternity, I think. I think that's how the Bible describes it, with a renewed creation. Okay. Uh huh. Psalm 82, I think. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't think so, because he says he takes his place in the divine council. And, and in the ancient world, the idea of the divine council um, was the idea that there was... I mean, I think this is what Paul, when in Genesis... Not Paul. When Moses writes in Genesis 1, Let's, let us make man in our own image, I don't think that's a reference to the Trinity. I think it's a reference to the divine council the heavenly beings, uh, the spiritual forces. I don't think, though, that um, it, when, uh, there are other Elohim besides Yahweh, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. Does that make sense? There, there are other Elohim than Yahweh, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. He takes his place in the divine council. He stands superior to all spiritual beings, I think. But I, don't, I think this is a description of spiritual forces. It's also interesting in John 10, 34, Jesus says, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, that I'm is interesting how he does it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, with the Jesus subdigent. Yeah. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad Jesus agrees with me. Thanks, Jack. Okay, guys. Let's uh, go ahead and come back together and say this next section of Ephesians. This might be my favorite section in Ephesians, actually. This pericope. Let's go ahead and read it. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to ask our two questions again. Right? How does this relate to the previous section? How does it relate to chapter 1, verse 10? But before we... <clears throat> okay, let's come back together. It's a shorter section, so it's a little bit easier to ask these questions, but how does it relate to the previous pericope, and how does it relate to um, chapter 1, verse 10? No, oh, yeah, that's great. And if you look at look at chapter 1, verse 15, how does that start? For this reason, right? Paul starts both of his prayers with for this reason, which is another reason I think that chapter 3, verse 1 was intended to be the beginning of the prayer. But instead, Paul went through the digression to explain his ministry a little bit deeper. But yeah, great observation. Yeah, Emmanuel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I think especially if, if the for this reason in chapter 3, verse 1 is intended to introduce the prayer at the end of chapter 3, which I think it was, 
then it's not only boldness and access, it's the fact that we're the new creation kingdom temple at the end of chapter 2. I, th I think we can read the for this reason and look back at the end of chapter 2 and we'll see what the reason is. But Paul makes sure that he ends his digression with that, with access and new creation kingdom temple language once again to make it clear. Good. Maybe one or two more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. Our love, or the Christ that love has, the, the love that Christ has for us. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk about Paul's prayer. Paul's prayer. And if we look at the structure of his prayer, Paul, uh, Paul's praying for three things in this section. Three things. Number one, he prays for strengthening. That's in verses 16 through 17. Number two, he's praying for a greater awareness of God's power verses 18 and 19 and 3 in the end of verse 19 he's praying to be filled with all the fullness of God those are the three things that he's praying for um, again the, the for this reason is likely pointing to the new creation temple the new creation kingdom temple at the end of chapter 2 and he returns then to worship at, the temple has been inaugurated the building has been completed in some senses, in other senses it's still growing. And now, like Solomon, after the inauguration of the temple, we're back to prayer, we're back to praising God. Which reminds us that chapters 1 through 3 is not a theological essay. It's not a theological essay, it's a worshipful celebration of what God has done for us in Christ. To make us his united new creation kingdom people. Uh, he calls God the Father here. There's a little bit of a word play. He's the Father from whom every family derives its name. Uh, his family's on earth and family's in heaven, he says. Now, what, what's a family in heaven? <laughs> what does that <laughs> refer to? Anyone have an idea? James looks like he knows. He, James is like ready to tackle this. I think that is what it's saying. Every family derives its pattern from God the Father. And fatherhood comes from God. Right? God did not look at Adam and Eve, and when they had Cain, he said, oh, like what Adam is? That's what, like what I am. I'm like a, like a dad. And then now that fatherhood exists because humans had children, now God takes upon himself the attribute of fatherhood. No, fatherhood exists because God exists. And we are intended to image God in our fatherhood. That's exactly right. That's the whole point of it. But, but what it means to have a family in heaven, I really don't know. I really don't know what that means. Every family in heaven and on earth. Um, it, it could be, yeah. Yeah, it could be either. But it's most likely, it's most likely family. Maybe. It's, it's unclear what Paul is talking about. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I just kind of want to introduce this category and then say no one really knows. No one really knows what it means. But what it certainly does mean by implication is that all fatherhood comes from God. All fatherhood derives it from God. It might be in reference to, like, the ordering of spiritual beings, maybe, but no one really knows <laughs> what this means. Uh, the naming, from whom every fatherhood is named. This, of course, reminds us of Adam naming in the garden. Uh, name, if you name something, you have authority over it. Um, so, yeah, all, all fatherhood derives its existence from God. That's the short and sweet of it. We don't need to spend much more time on that. The prayer is what's most interesting. So, first, he prays for, prays for strengthening. And he prays it in two different ways. First, he prays that they be strengthened with power. They be strengthened with power. That they be strengthened in their Christian lives, I think is what he's saying. So that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being. He prays that they be strengthened with power. Um, of course, it's a little bit unnecessary to say strengthened with power. That's a little bit redundant. Because if you're strengthened, of course you're strengthened with power. Um, but it's the purpose for emphasizing the greatness of this power that he wants you to be strengthened with. Similar to chapter 1, verse 19 that we saw earlier. The great power that he worked in Christ and raised him from the dead. And again, it's the riches of God's power. Again, God is seen as a rich man in this text. We've seen him as rich in mercy, uh, rich in his love, rich in his kindness, and now rich in his power 
and he doesn't use that richness to hoard it. He's a generous, kind, rich man. That's how Paul sees him. It means he has limitless power that's available to us who believe, that he's putting it towards us. So I, I think I, I, we've alluded to this before, but I really want to kind of press down applicationally on this, this theme of God being the rich man. Um, do you, are you tempted, or do you, are there people maybe in our congregations who are tempted to see God as stingy or miserly? Or like Scrooge. Like God has great power. God has great kindness. God has great love. But he's unwilling to dispense it. I feel that in my own heart sometimes. Like, that sure, God has this vast amount of kindness, vast amount of mercy, vast amount of love, but maybe he doesn't want to spend it on me. Do you ever feel that way? Or do you think people in our congregations do? texts like this, we, we need to combat that. It, it's something that's kind of underlying and just kind of in the back of our heads a lot of times. We might not ever articulate it like that, but we might feel that way. And texts like this are given to combat that. Um, becoming more aware of the uncertain riches of Christ. I don't know, how do you, do you guys see that played out in certain ways in your context? Or we could say, what, what's the result of thinking that God is like that? What do we do when we forget that God is a rich man who loves to spend prayerlessness? Yeah, that's true. We don't pray because we don't think God really wants to hear from us. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. I think the Garden of Eden is a great picture. How many, how many no trees... There was yes trees in the garden, there were no trees in the garden. How many no trees were there in the garden? One. There was one no tree. And tons of yes trees. <laughs> God is not the God who says there's all these no's and a little bit of yeses. God is the God who loves to say yes. And he just, we, what he was holds from us is for our good. Not because he wants to not give us the joy that that uh, we could potentially have. That's great. What else? We can. Ne this is the point. We can never exhaust God's bank account of love for us. We can never exhaust the bank account of God's love and mercy and kindness and power towards us. There's, whenever you go to the ATM looking for more love and looking for more power and looking for more grace and looking for more kindness, the ATM spits out even more than what you ask for. It's limitless. It never comes to its end. And, he, and God doesn't do that with an attitude of, okay, here you go. He's not obligated. He doesn't feel like he's obligated to. He does it because he loves you. He's kind. He's a rich man who loves to give to his children. And how does he do it in this text? It's through the Spirit, right? Through his spirit. And so that's, again, it's very similar to the prayer that we saw earlier in 1 15 through 23. Before, Paul prayed that God would make them more aware that the power is already there. And now, Paul prays that they would actually experience that power. Before, is a prayer for illumination, that we would understand that there is power that is ours. Now, he's praying that we'd actually have it. And where, where does he want us to have that power? It's in the inner self. What's that in reference to? What's, what's your inner self? And it could be a number of things. It's pro most likely in reference to your new self, your, your new humanity, the part of you that's part of the new creation kingdom already, or all of you is. It's not like part of you is held back and they're fighting. It, it, what he means is that, that you would experience deep down in a new creation kingdom kind of way, that power that God has for you. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through, or 2 Corinthians 4, 16 also. Where Paul says, 
we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. This is a very similar language to what he uses in the prayer, right? The inner self, outer self. The new creation self versus the old creation self that's slowly wasting away. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Second, that's the first. He first prays that we be strengthened with power. And secondly, he prays that Christ would further indwell them. He prays that Christ would further indwell them. And it's most likely that the strengthening with power, the result of that is that Christ would further indwell them. He prays to be strengthened with power so that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. That's confusing right there. <laughs> Have, hasn't one of the main things we've been saying is that we're united with Christ? All the blessings of the new creation kingdom come to us already in Christ? Why would Paul pray that believers who are already united to Christ would experience Christ dwelling in them. Is Paul talking about unbelievers maybe here? I, I, no, he's not. He's talking about believers. He's praying that Christ would dwell in the hearts of believers through faith. What is that? How, how do we reconcile that? We're already united to Christ. What does it mean to have Christ dwell in our hearts? So it's an experience of being more inclined to love Christ. Okay. Does Christ dwell in your heart right now? Should we pray that Christ would dwell in your heart? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Any other ideas? What does it mean... And I think Yisakor is getting at something. He's getting at kind of what it looks like and feels like. But if we're already united to Christ, how can Paul pray that Christ would dwell in our hearts? How can we pray for believers who are already united to Christ that Christ would dwell in their hearts more? <laughs> yeah, A.B. Yeah. I, I think Paul, Paul is praying for an experiential union or communion with Christ. Paul is praying for, we could talk about this all day long, right? We could keep hearing from different people, but I think, and short of it, Paul is not praying for a deeper positional union with Christ. You are as united to Christ as you ever will be. This is like you're as, as justified as you ever will be. You're as adopted as you ever will be. There's not a greater degree to which you could be united to Christ. However, you can experience deeper communion with Jesus. And it takes spiritual strength to experience that. It takes the Spirit's work for you to know what it feels like for Jesus Christ to further dwell in your heart. And the, mean, the, the means, the means by which Christ dwells in our heart is faith. It's through faith. I think this explains more of what it means by the Spirit strengthening us. Because the, one of the roles of the Spirit is to give faith to believers. So as the Spirit strengthens us and we receive faith from Him, we then experience to a greater degree communion with Jesus. So the, uh, the Puritans would differentiate between union with Christ and communion with Christ. Union with Christ means I'm, I am already united to Christ. But my, my experiential communion, the degree to which I experience nearness to Jesus, that can go up and down. I think this text would point us toward, if, if you're experiencing lows in that, this text would point us towards praying that the Spirit would strengthen us and give us faith so that Christ would further dwell in our hearts in an experiential way. I mean, I, and this whole section is full of it, but just to point out, when Paul says things like, search out the unsearchable riches of Christ, or later to know the unknowable love of Christ, or for Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith, or even when he says things like, I'm, the least, I'm lesser than the least of all the saints, these are all, this is all language that, even though Paul was, Paul was a heady guy, 
right? He, he's very logical. Paul is a very logical, brainy person, but he has a category for experiencing God. He, he has a heart of a pastor, uh, and he, he desires more than just a logical relationship with Jesus. He desires a living, breathing relationship with his Lord. And he desires that all these believers would also experience what it means to not just know about Jesus and not just know about the gospel, to experience deeply what the gospel is and what the gospel means, and to experience deep fellowship with Jesus. He then says that you being rooted and grounded in love, and I, I, I take this as going with the, the previous uh, prayer. I don't think it goes with what in verse 18. I think it finishes up the prayer in verse 17, the prayer for spiritual strength. So is he, is he asking here that these believers would be rooted in love? What, what's he saying? What is this? What's the end of verse 17? What does it mean? he praying that they would be rooted and grounded in love? Yeah, I think that's right. He's not praying that these believers would be more loved by God. He's saying because you are rooted and grounded in love, because you are already loved by God, may Christ dwell in your heart through faith. I said it wrong, didn't I? I didn't say your hearts. Do you see it? It's the plural. It's y'all's hearts. We're still not talking about individuals. We're talking about the church collective. Paul is not just praying that one individual believer would experience this nearness with Christ. He's praying that the church collective would, ex would experience a nearness to Christ that can only be described as Christ came down and dwelt in our hearts. And sure, this has implication for our private prayer life, but I think especially for Sunday morning services or community group gatherings, small group gatherings, discipleship groups, that we would have an experience of nearness and communion with Christ, that if someone came to you and said, what was it like at this week's service? You said, the only, the only way you can describe it is Christ came and dwelt with us. I, I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> Jesus was there. And he took up residence in our hearts, there was a, a sense in which we experience nearness to Jesus that's unusual, that we don't always feel. We all knew what it was like. So then you have to, you have to ask, what, what does it look like to have this power? What does it look like to have Christ dwell in your heart through faith? What, is it, what does it actually look like and feel like in the corporate gathering, in your personal life? So I want you to tell me, if, if someone came up to you, you know, two friends, how, how was your Sunday service? Oh, it was good. And the pastor preached on this. And then you say back to them, how was your Sunday service? And they say, it was incredible. Christ dwelt in our hearts through faith, and we were filled with all the fullness of God. And you're like, oh, wow, okay. I want you to tell me, what do you assume happened at that service? What do you assume happened at that service? Did they say, we were filled with all the fullness of God and Christ dwelt in our hearts through faith? Oh yeah, that's the first one, right? I mean, everyone, everyone was speaking in tongues. Even Yisakor was speaking in tongues, right? <laughs> everyone was. <laughs> what, else, what else do you assume happened? Prophecy, yeah, prophecy and healing karate kicking babies off stages and stuff like that. Like, that's the stuff you assume happened, right? But what does Paul say it looks like? That you being rooted and grounded in love, he's, he's praying for this power, so that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ. That surpasses knowledge. He prays that they would be strengthened with power he doesn't apply it towards fighting sin. 
He doesn't apply towards speaking in tongues. He doesn't apply towards prophecy. He doesn't apply towards healing. He doesn't apply towards strength and power to have better karate chops. He applies it with meaning strength and power to know how much Christ loves you. And that, this is the charismatic experience that Paul is describing, <laughs> is to know the depth of the love of Christ. He'd be strengthened to grasp something, to know something. To know the totality of Christ's love for them, the width and length and height and depth. It's like he's describing a large object, right? Like this massive object that's maybe out on the horizon. It was so big. It was uh, just to think of the width and length and height and depth of this massive object. And then what is the object he's describing? Christ's love. And do you see how we are to know, how we would have strength to comprehend this? It's with all the saints. As uh, was mentioned earlier, it's with the other believers. So, um, what this means is knowing the degree to which Christ loves you is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. It's a team sport. Right? It's not like golf. It's like football. We all work together. And this can happen a number of different ways. It can happen as we, we talk to one another about the love of Christ and what we've experienced of the love of Christ and what we know of the love of Christ. And then, and then we say to the other person, what, what do you know about the love of Jesus? Tell me about the love of Jesus, how you've experienced it and what you see in the Bible, the Bible of the love of Christ. But I think it also, it also has implications for the Jew-Gentile division. And multiple ethnicities in a church. That not, not only can we know something more of the love of Christ for us when our brothers and sisters talk about it with us and we share life together, but there are things we can only know of the love of Christ when we experience the multi-ethnic new creation kingdom. The kingdom that saves both Jews and Gentiles. The kingdom that when it comes, saves people from a variety of races. Something of the love of Christ is known when we see that. That's not known otherwise. Then he, he, he calls it the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. That we would, he says, know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Before, he talked about searching out the unsearchable riches of Christ. And now he's talking about knowing the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That no matter how deeply you know the love of Jesus, it goes deeper. The love and care of Christ for each and every one of us always goes deeper than what we currently know. And there's always depths that cannot be plummeted of Christ's kind, gentle love for each one of his saints. And do you see it it takes spiritual strength to know it. You can't, ju you can't just know that Christ loves you without the Spirit working to give you strength to know that Christ loves you. I mean, I think all of us know what this feels like. All of us have had this experience of, I wish, or I, I feel as though Christ does not love me, or I feel as though I've gotten to the end of God's love for me. And the answer to that is spiritual strength spiritual enablement, spiritual power, that we would know the depths of the love of Christ for us. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think, so I think, I think what we have to, first we have to come to grips with the fact that we are always loved to a greater degree than we know or that even we experience. And there's always deeper experiences of the love of Christ that we, can, that we can have. And the Spirit must come in order for us to know what that's like. What it looks like in ministry, I think it, it means we meditate on the love of Christ every single day through the gospel. And we tell people to do that. 
basically say you can meditate on the love of Christ every day and still not know the full depths to which Christ loves you. Um, it, it, this is what it means also. Have you seen, have you guys, you guys have read the Chronicles of Narnia or no? Mike, you have. So you just watched it. Oh, that's, that's a shame. There's a scene in uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader where they get to this one island, and at the island is this massive feast. And, and like no one's sitting at the table. It's just this huge feast of the most delicious food you've ever seen. Do you remember this, Mikey? And they see the feast, and they assume it's not for them. They assume it's for someone else. But actually, it's for them. And it takes them being prompted, like, just go eat it. Like, enjoy that feast is for you. Go and eat. Eat as much as you want. And eat more. <laughs> it's like that, I think, with the love of Christ. Like, sometimes we feel like there's no way that's really for me. It's too wonderful. There's no way I can indulge. Maybe, maybe I can go in and kind of eat reluctantly. Maybe I can go in and kind of experience the love of Christ reluctantly. No. Dive in. Go and eat. It's all for you. Nothing's held back. All of the love of Christ is all for you, so go and enjoy. I'm going to tell people things like that. And this means we don't stand back and, and wonder, like, is that really for me? We enjoy to its full extent. And uh, we make this kind of language part of our prayers in our church as well, I think that we would all collectively know to a greater degree the extent of Christ's love for us. And lastly, uh, Paul prays that God may be filled with all the fullness of God. May be filled with all the fullness of God. This is, this is kind of the climactic request. And I don't think it's different than the other requests. I don't think he's been talking about knowing the love of Christ, knowing the love of God, and all of a sudden he gets to the end, and now he's thinking about speaking in tongues and karate chops and things like that. I think he's getting to the end, and he's saying the experience of knowing the love of Christ is the experience of God dwelling in the temple. He's relating it to the tabernacle temple stories, when God's presence comes and fills the temple tabernacle. And you know that God has chosen to take up residence among you. You know experientially that God is there. And that God loves you. And God has chosen to be with you. I mean, for the Israelites, there was no question if God had chosen them. Because in the, in the wilderness wandering, if you want to know, hey, is God with you? Has God chosen you? Are you God's special people? All you have to do is walk outside your tent and say, yes, right there. See it? The pillar of fire by day and the smoke by night. It's right there. But for us, we have an even better reality if we can, by the strength of the Spirit, grasp it. That God dwells in our hearts, the hearts of the church, by faith. And Christ loves us. So experientially, we're already filled with the full, or, uh, not experientially, um, positionally, we're already, we as the temple are already filled with the fullness of God, but Paul prays that experientially, we would be filled with all the fullness of God. And ultimately, this is language of heaven and earth uniting, isn't it? That heaven and earth would unite in an experiential way, and that we as the new creation kingdom temple would know what it feels like for God to be in our midst as we further know the love that Christ has for us through the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The experiential presence of God, yeah, that comes, especially that we would know the love of Christ for us. I think that the context of the prayer is all about knowing the love of Christ. So he's praying that we would, we would have an experience of God drawing near to us that results in us understanding to a greater degree that God loves us. If you want to talk about charismatic theology, this is charismatic theology. This is experiential theology. And when Paul talks about God, when this is, this is maybe the most lofty language of experiencing the presence of God in the entire New Testament. Maybe the entire Bible. Yeah, probably the entire Bible, because he's talking about God dwelling in our hearts. Filled that you, that y'all, the church, would be filled with all the fullness of God. 
nothing held back. But Paul does not talk about speaking in tongues. He talks about knowing the love of Christ. That's a charismatic ministry of the Spirit. That we experience what it means to a greater degree that Christ loves us. In fact, when Paul talks about being filled with the Spirit later, he does not talk about speaking in tongues either. Paul never talks about speaking in tongues in Ephesians. Even in the spiritual warfare section, he doesn't talk about speaking in tongues. Or prophecy. He talks about, in this section, knowing that Christ loves you. Then it ends with the doxology, right? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can all a- than we can ask or think. He's able to do far more than we could ever imagine. He's able to join Jews and Gentiles together. He's able to make us part of the new creation kingdom. He's able to exalt Christ to the right hand of the Father. He's able to make him Lord over everything and subject all the powers in heaven and on earth to him and to bring unity to everything. He's able to do more than we could ask or imagine. This is not talking about physical blessings. This is talking about what God has done for us in Christ in and through the gospel. If God is able to reconcile Jews and Gentiles and make us the new creation kingdom temple, then he is able to do far more abundantly than we can ever ask or think, according to the power at work within us, the power through the Spirit, that we know and experience the love of Christ. To him be glory. Let's praise him. Praise him in response to this. In the church, the members of the new creation kingdom, and in the Lord of the new creation kingdom, and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.